Hallo zusammen. Kennst du den Sinn deines Lebens? Weißt du, was du von deinem Leben erwarten darfst? Wenn nicht, dann hast du das Buch »Das Café am Rande der Welt« nicht gelesen. Aber dafür haben wir den Autor, John Strilecki, dessen Bücher weltweit Millionen von Menschen inspirieren, zu Gast in der heutigen Sternstunde Religion. You most welcome, John. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me here. Wofür leben Sie? <laughs> uh, you know, if I was to define myself as one thing, it would be an adventurer. And I would say my top priority over the course of my life within that adventurer uh, has been being a father. Wow. Das heißt, ein Abenteuer Vaters zu sein. Und wissen Sie, was ich erwartet habe? Schokolade. Wir sind immerhin in der Schweiz. <lacht> ich es lohnt sich, für die Schokolade zu leben. I'm going to tell you a very sad story, Milad, which is when I was about 10 years old, maybe 11 years old, I started to get massive headaches and they couldn't figure out what was causing them. And they eventually learned that I was allergic to caffeine. And so from that day forward, it meant no more chocolate, no more soda. Like I had to give up so many of the things that uh, everyone else gets to love. But uh, yeah, no more. Okay, es ist vielleicht möglich, eine But Süßigkeit <laughs> im Leben zu entdecken, was jenseits der Schokolade ist. <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, Zurich has so much else to offer in addition to the chocolate. Uh, yeah. So yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Wir werden heute unter anderem und insbesondere über so etwas wie ähm, Lebensmeistern, Sinnsuche im Leben sprechen. Äh, da würde ich gerne zunächst fragen, was verstehen Sie unter dem Begriff Sinn des Lebens? Sie sprechen weniger vom Sinn im Englischen, sondern eher von so etwas wie Zweck der Existenz, eine Art, ähm, also nicht so metaphysisch aufgeladen, Sinn im Deutschen hat eine lange Tradition, sondern eine andere Form. Was ist das für Sie? Uh, you know, actually, I would say that the very starting point for me is meaning. Um, and you mentioned Das Café am Rand der Welt. And so the very first question on the cafe menu is, why are you here? And that question is the starting point where meaning evolves from. Uh, I, it took me a long time. It wasn't until I was in my 30s before I figured out enough of life to ask that question. I think the earlier you can ask that question, then the more profound your life can become, the more meaningful your life can become. Uh, because it's, it's asking, in essence, what do you want to do with this gift of the 28,900 days or so that you get? What is the point? And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful starting place to approach every day and certainly an amazing starting point to approach a life. Sie sagen, dass Sie mit, mit 30 ungefähr sich diese Frage gestellt haben. Gab es einen besonderen Anlass dafür, dass Sie ausgerechnet dann mit dieser Frage konfrontiert wurden? I think I was asking it before, but I didn't have the context to really put it into the perspective that I did when I was in my 30s. Because I, I had a moment, my grandfather passed away in my early 30s, and he lived to be in his 80s. And I, I remember to this day the, the scene. It's like so much of life you can't remember, but I remember that day. And it's kind of odd because I wasn't even that close to him. We had only met maybe a dozen times, 12 times in my life. But I distinctly remember where I was. I was in my apartment. I can see the blue couch. I was standing in the kitchen talking to my mom, and she told me. And I just remember thinking, wow, like he lived to be 80 you know, plus years. If I live to be 80 plus years and I continue on the path I'm on, when I get to the end, will I feel like I won? Like, will I feel like life was meaningful? Will I feel like I lived my purpose? And so for some reason, that was very transformative, that particular day, that particular event. So, yeah. Das zeigt, dass Sie eigentlich nicht genau wissen, was Sie einen Tag davor gemacht haben, sondern dieser Tag scheint eine eigene Dichte zu haben. Ist das, weswegen Sie auch immer wieder davon sprechen, dass das Leben dann lebenswert wird, wenn wir das Leben in, in seiner Dichte, in seiner Intensität ergreifen? Ja, yeah, I think the the earlier you can get the awareness that this human experience does not go on forever. You know, when you're young, you just feel so 
invincible. Uh, it just seems like life is going to go on forever. You know, you're a kid, you're six years old, and your your mom or your dad says, oh, well, how old do you think your teacher is? Oh, they're really old, right? <laughs> and the parents find out that they're like 30. <laughs> you know? But as a kid, you're like, oh, that's like so old. And if you have the ability to look at life from kind of the timeline perspective and realize that it doesn't go on forever and that you're going to be losing things along the way, you lose physical capacity along the way, uh, you maybe lose some of your energy, you lose some of your courage along the way. It does give you the motivation to live the life that you want to live sooner rather than later. And I don't know, maybe this used to happen better when it was generational living because you'd actually be in the same house as a grandparent, right? Or an aunt or somebody. And uh, yeah, maybe we've lost something there. I don't know. But I think the awareness of the timeline is critical. Ja, diese, diese Lebensteilung, die in gewisser Weise fehlt. Auf der anderen Seite, äh, es gibt Ihnen recht, diese Frage ernst zu nehmen, diese Frage zu stellen, allein schon der Erfolg Ihrer Bücher. Sie leben in Florida, in, äh, äh, ja, in einer ziemlich warmen Gegend. Und äh, Ihre Bücher, Ihre Gedanken äh, haben natürlich die ganze Welt fast schon erobert. Das zeigt aber auch ein, ein Bedürfnis, diese Frage zu stellen. Meine Frage an Sie wäre, warum? Warum muss man sich mit dieser Frage konfrontieren? Yeah, well, so one of the most interesting things, and I'd love to hear your perspective on this from your life as well, is that when I was growing up, and like I said, I had this turning point when I was in my 30s, but for as long as I could remember, I would look at people living life, and it seemed like... The strategy was you go through school. I didn't really like school. Uh, I did well, but didn't really see the point of it, right? And then you get done with sort of your lower level school, and then you go on to college, right? And that was more fun, so that was better. Uh, and then as I looked at the world when I was a little kid, it seemed like then you get a job, and most people don't like their job. And so as long as school lasted, the job thing, that was going to last a really long time. Like that's for decades, right? And most people didn't seem to like their job and didn't seem to have a heart connection. And there was the standard like, oh, Monday mornings. Like it was in cartoons, it was in movies. And I just remember as a kid thinking, what am I missing? Like, <laughs> isn't there more than this? Like, there's got to be a piece of the puzzle that I'm just not getting. And so I was constantly thinking to myself, isn't there more? I just didn't have the awareness to ask the more meaningful question, like, why am I here from a bigger metaphysical perspective? So I don't know. Did you ever have that experience when you were a kid or like growing up? Like, huh, <laughs> is this all there is? <laughs> Bei mir war es anders. Ich bin um in Krieg aufgewachsen, in Kabul, in Afghanistan. Und dann sind wir geflüchtet. Und auf der Flucht ähm, habe ich bemerkt, dass das Leben ein anderes ist. Es ist nicht alles wie gewohnt. Ich besuche mhm. kein humanistisches Gymnasium, studiere, mache Praktika, habe meine erste Freundin und so weiter. Sondern das Leben hat mich ganz anders äh, bewegt. Insofern, ich sozusagen als Jugendlicher, vielleicht 15 Jahre vor Ihnen, mir diese Frage stellen musste, im Grunde genommen aus der tiefen Betroffenheit des Lebens. Zugleich, wenn ich Ihrer Analysen folge, höre ich dort, dass Sie sagen, es liegt vor allem an unserer neoliberalen Gesellschaft, dass wir eben arbeiten, aber Dinge tun, die wir ungern tun. Und weil wir die lange ungern tun, macht uns das in gewisser Weise bedürftig, wiederum Sinnstiftung zu finden. I think wired within the human, first of all, thank you for sharing that piece of your story. And one of the things I find most fascinating as I have traveled the world and I, I love to do adventure travel. So I love to go to places that are off the grid and most people don't go to because I want to see the planet before my time is done. I want to experience the cultures. I want to see the way others live. And the broader your worldview becomes, There's an inverse relationship between the size of my problem that I perceive to be and the broader my worldview. And so when you either have through a personal life experience like yours uh, or when you travel and have a broader vision, you realize that there are so many elements to the life story 
that are not like these gifts were not given to you because of what you did or what you earned. Uh, you just got lucky and got that. And I think it makes you uh, a kinder person. I think it gives you a broader world perspective. And I actually think it deepens the inquisitiveness to ask the question. Like, why? Why, why did I grow up in you know, Illinois in the Midwest of the United States and experience the life and childhood that I did where you, another soul going through the human experience, grew up in Kabul? and experienced as a child something as traumatic as having to flee in war. And if I'm able to step back, and we collectively, you and I, are able to step back from the experience and really have a dialogue about that, I think we learn a lot about the human experience as, like, why does it exist? Why, why do, why, if, we're either something before we're born, mm -hmm. right, and then we enter the human experience, or we're not. Like, I, I think when you boil it down, it comes down to that those two options. And so it does, I think, open up the chance for an amazingly human dialogue to say, what were your joys? What were your struggles? And what were my joys and what were my struggles? And how can we learn from each other so that going forward, we can both have a more amazing human experience and maybe more empathetic as well? Es ist interessant, weil sowohl die, die Geschichte der Philosophie äh, genau mit dieser Haltung begann, wenn man an Platon, Aristoteles denkt, nämlich Philosophie beginnt, wenn wir staunen lernen. Wenn wir staunen, das heißt Dinge sehen, als würden wir sie zum ersten Mal sehen. Und auf der anderen Seite die Weltreligionen, ja. wenn man sie so bezeichnen darf, äh, sind äh, intensivst von dieser Frage, von diesen Fragen bewegt. Wo besteht mein Glück? Worin besteht mein Elend? Warum bin ich ich? Was ist... Der, der sind letztlich der Zweck meiner Existenz. Und für diese Fragen, die Sie in einer ganz anderen Form wieder einholen, äh, haben Sie in äh, Ihren Büchern äh, dieses, ein Konzept von äh, Big Five, also die großen Fünf, entwickelt. Ähm, und da gehen Sie natürlich, äh, Ihre Assoziation ist auch, äh, wenn die Safari-Touristen in Af Afrika unterwegs sind, dann äh, sehen Sie, wollen Sie unbedingt diese großen Fünf Tiere sehen, nämlich Löwe, Leopard, Nashorn, Elefant und Büffel. Sie waren dort äh, und Sie haben diese Erfahrung gemacht. Wie kamen Sie aus dieser einfachen touristischen Erfahrung ein lebenserfüllendes Konzept zu entwickeln? Ja, yeah, uh, so I had dreamed of being an adventurer, like I said, since I was a small child. And the, probably the most dominant piece of that dream was to experience the animals of Africa and to see it. And when I travel, as I mentioned, I don't like to do it as a standard tourist. I like to do it as someone who is visiting the country and experiencing the country in its sort of natural way. And so when I was wandering Africa, it was staying in a little A-frame tent and uh, interacting with the amazing people and the amazing culture and beauty and nature of Africa. And it was completely transformative in part because there was a piece of me that would wake up every morning and think to myself, I can't believe I got here. You know, like, here's me, just some kid from the Midwest living in like a sort of farm area. And I got here, like I, I, I actually got to see this, something I had dreamed about since I literally was a tiny little boy. And, you know, the, I, I know it's not as dramatic these days because there's so much content available for everybody to look at. But when I was growing up, like you had the encyclopedia and you had National Geographic magazine and that was it. There was no YouTube, there was no TikTok, there was no Instagram. There were no websites you could look at like videos of Africa. The idea of going to Africa, I might as well have said, I'm going to go to the store, start building a rocket ship and fly myself to Mars. Like it was that completely out of the realm of possibility. And I got to go there, I got to see it, I got to experience it. And I think part of the reason that it turned into this concept of the Big Five for Life is because it was so emotionally and energetically and cellular profound for me that I got to do, see or experience something that I had wished my whole life for. Können Sie ganz kurz ähm, zusammenfassen, worum geht es in diesem Konzept von diesem Big Five? Yeah, uh, so that's it. It's, it's allowing ourselves as a human experiencing the physical form, the human life, to identify the five things that we most want to do, see or experience in our lifetime while we're here. 
And it, it is the five things that are so powerful that if you were to do, see, or experience them during your life, that in the last moments of your existence, right, when you're very, very old and you're reflecting and thinking, that you would say to yourself and you would feel at a deep emotional level that I did it. Like, I got to live the life that I dreamed of living. My life was a success by my own definition of success. Uh, you know, you, you and I were talking offline about what is the point of this interview? Like, what does success look like? And the goal is to bring something into the, the mind of the viewer that hopefully helps them live an amazing life in some capacity. And that's really what I think life comes down to. How do you define success for yourself? And are you able to allow yourself to even believe that it's possible to do, see, or experience these five things. And once you know them, then you get to, it's like a game, you get to allocate your resources, your time, your energy, uh, your finances certainly, but your emotional thoughts around these things. And they can be long-term in nature. Like you may say, I wanna have a loving relationship. I don't, are, do you have children? Yes, yes I have. Great, so you may say one of my big five for life is to have a loving relationship with my children. And that's something that could go on for your entire existence, right? Um, another one might be short-term in nature. So, I don't know, is there a place that you want to travel that you haven't traveled to yet? Yeah, klar, klar. Es gibt uh, Mecca. Okay, <laughs> great. So, so that would be... There, sehen, so sort. there you go. So you say, okay, one of my big five for life that I want to do, see, or experience is to visit Mecca, right? And so when you have done that and you've experienced that and all the profound aspects of that, well, then it's kind of, it'll stay with you forever, of course, but it's done and you've experienced it. Yeah. And Darf ich ganz kurz an dieser Stelle kurz unterbrechen mit ihr, weil an dieser Stelle, yeah. bevor wir über ihre, ihre fünf äh, großen ähm, äh, ja, Ziele sprechen, das mit dem Beispiel von, von Mekka äh, könnte ich vielleicht eine etwas kritischeres äh, befragen, nämlich... Ähm, Mekka ist für mich ein Sehnsuchtsort, wie für eine andere Person ein anderer Ort sein yeah. kann. Aber das ist genau der Ort, in dem ich jetzt nicht sein will, weil dieser Ort von einer bestimmten Sekte äh, beherrscht wird, die meine Religiosität in gewisser Weise beschmutzt. Das ist eine Grundsäule meines Glaubens, aber ich würde den Teufel tun, dahin zu gehen, weil ich gerade das nicht machen will. Ich will ein Mecker haben, was gerade heute nicht sein kann. Das heißt, wir können Träume haben. Wir können ein, ein, ein Ziel haben, aber das Leben scheint nicht so rein zu sein, so einfach, dass ich dann auch für mein Ziel alles tue. Jetzt muss ich mir so Aufgabe machen, diese Regierung zu stürzen, ihnen zu zeigen, warum eine religiöse Sekte einen islamischen, sozusagen heiligen Ort äh, in Anspruch genommen hat. Das ist vielleicht zu groß für mich. Ähm, was ist, wenn, wenn die, die Träume eigentlich gar nicht zu realisieren sind? Das ist die Frage. Yeah, well, this is going, this is the wonderful thing that happens when we are able to step back farther from the experience. In the midst of the experience, of course, it seems a very real and powerful and dangerous potent potentially, right? It brings out emotions, it brings out um, excitement, certainly, potentially fear, uncertainty. Uh, I wrote a little book that is set in Africa called Safari des Lebens, and there is a character in there called Mama Gombe. And the advice of Mama Gombe is so much bigger than anything that exists inside my head. When I, when I wrote that book, it, it was 10 days of just channeling the essence of this amazing, beautiful spirit. And she describes something and she says, imagine if you went to go play football. Imagine life as if a football, it's a football field. And she said, so on the first day, there it is. It's like this beautiful football field. I mean, it's just, it's like everything you could dream of as a football player, right? And there is the ball, it's brand new. It is the same one the professionals use, right? And so you just can't believe it. You're just like, this is the dream of all dreams. And so you start running up and down the field and you're doing drills and you're kicking goals. And it's just, it's awesome for about a day. And then what happens? It gets boring, right? Mm. Because there's no challenge. And so what would you do to make it less boring? Well, maybe you'd add teammates. So now you've got three or four friends and you're kicking it down the field together, right? And you're scoring goals together. And that would be fun mm -hmm. for maybe a day. And then that's gonna get boring. Mm -hmm. Why? Because there's no challenge. Mm -hmm. 
And so what gets added to the game? A defender, mm. right? And in the human experience, if it was just effortlessly easy to fulfill our big five for life, A, we would get no real sense of satisfaction from it. And I don't think that we would learn a lot from the experience. And I do believe point of the human, uh, at least a major point of the human experience is, is to contribute to what I call the collective consciousness. Hmm. And when I have an experience where I grow, where I overcome a challenge, it enters the consciousness and now is available to everyone. Hmm. When they do the same thing, it is now available to me and to everyone else. Yeah. So I would say to tie yeah. this into your question specifically, hmm. that if going was effortless, I'm not sure it would have the same impact. And for you to overcome any uncertainties or fears, for you to perhaps scale it down to say, I need to be enough in my own headspace that when I go there, I can just be on my pilgrimage without feeling the need to change the world, <laughs> but I can just focus on me and my calling and my faith and figure out the rest after that. Like that's a real challenge. No. And so maybe that's the way this moment in the giant algorithm of this human experience is designed specifically for you. Ja, ja. Also, wenn, wenn ich Sie richtig verstehe, dann äh, geht es bei Ihnen äh, nicht nur darum, dass wir Ziele haben und die Ziele erreichen, sondern es geht darum, überhaupt Ziele zu definieren, wofür wir uns dann auch öffnen. Ja. Sei es auch, wenn wir daran scheitern oder Widersprüche daran erkennen, äh, sondern es geht darum, auch diesen Weg zu würdigen, einen neuen Weg zu schaffen, äh, Pilgerreise neu definieren, Mecker neu entdecken. Äh, das, äh, das klärt in der Tat. Sie sind mir noch schuldig geblieben, was die äh, großen fünf Ziele für Sie sind, aber darauf komme ich noch zurück, denn an dieser Stelle würde ich Ihnen gerne eine andere Frage stellen weil es sozusagen dazu passt, nämlich ähm, die, die Idee, dass wir unser Leben im Griff kriegen sollten, dass wir unser Leben selbst meistern, dass wir unser Leben äh, beherrschen in gewisser Weise, entwickeln Sie vor allem mit, mit, einem, mit, einer, mit einem Symbol, nämlich die Symbolik äh, des Cafés, vor allem auch in vielen Büchern, in diesem Buch insbesondere, nämlich das Café am Rande der Welt, meine Frage ist, was für ein Symbol ist das? Denn ich habe den Eindruck, man muss immer aus dem Alltag herausbrechen, um dann darüber zu reflektieren, wie Sie es auch in Ihrem Buch schreiben. Also der, der Protagonist, der auf einer Autobahn ungefähr ist und es geht nicht mehr weiter, verliert den Weg, hat kaum Benzin und dann findet er einfach einen, einen Kaffee am Rande der Welt, im Nirgendwo. Und aus diesem Nirgendwo, in dieser Utopie, entwickelt sich so etwas wie echte Fragen des Lebens. Brauchen wir über ein ja. Outside, ein Außerhalb? <lacht> well, I think it depends on the person. Uh, for me, especially now, there are so many distractions to conscious thought. Um, in the fourth book in the Cafe series, I call it being pleasantly occupied. And so, you know, we all typically have smartphones, I was just talking to my colleague actually and you're driving, you come up to a stoplight and you look right and you look left and you see on the phone, on the phone, right? Um, I go to uh, my daughter's school and I see the kids walking down the street to the school on the phone, on the phone. <laughs> yeah. And the challenge there is that typically when you're in a bit of boredom, then you're asking the question, what can I do to not be bored? You're consciously aware that the minutes of life are passing by. And I think on a deep level, even before we're entering the physical form, we know that this is an amazing experience, potentially. And we know it's an amazing planet if we want to see it. And so I think we're wired with that awareness. But if we're always spending our time just what I call pleasantly occupied, then we never do disconnect. We never allow ourselves to get bored enough to ask the question, what would be extraordinary? What would take me beyond bored? And I think the danger there for me, for you, for everybody, is that we get to the end and realize, oh, I just, I was just pleasantly occupied the whole time. And I don't think that's why we enter the human experience. I think we're here for much more than that. Yeah. But this is the equivalent of the soccer field now. Like yeah. at this moment in the human story, Maybe we had gotten it all figured out enough to the point that, you know, the algorithm, the universe, God, whatever your belief system entails is like, huh, 
we need another defender. <laughs> <laughs> we need another challenge. So let's throw this into the mix. Yeah. Pleasantly occupied. Für uns ist das natürlich etwas anders, weil wir natürlich auch eine Zeit ohne Smartphone kennen. Das heißt auch eine Zeit, die in gewisser Weise mehr Langeweile zum Leben gehörte. Und allein schon deswegen sollte man die deutsche Sprache lernen, weil das Wort Langeweile, das ist etwas, was langgeweilt, das ist etwas, was länger sich hält und äh, mm. das ist etwas, was sie äh, positiv deuten und im Grunde genommen äh, uns ans Herz legen, äh, du sollst Langeweile suchen und Langeweile aushalten lernen. <lacht> I don't know if you should necessarily look for it, but realize the potential benefit that comes from that moment of this is not the life that I want to be living, right? And so whether that means, oh, I'm going to call a friend or I'm going to go see a movie or I'm going to go grab my soccer ball and go play soccer, football, whatever. But uh, I think that it's an important piece of the growth element of humanity is to have the difference that you're talking about. Now, the fascinating thing about life to me is that everything comes with a yin and a yang. And so, yes, that little device and all the access to information is potentially the single greatest barrier to living a life of fulfillment. The counter is that if you have a deep desire to learn to play piano, or we were talking about my learning German, right? My quest to learn German. Uh, or to learn to plant pink petunias in the f fall in an uh, area that has nine inches of rain, right? <laughs> Something so ridiculously yeah. specific. You can get on your phone and in seconds you can get unbelievable as aspects of information that was impossible to get in our childhood. Yeah. So it's a question of usage. It's a question of intention. It's a question of awareness. That's the beautiful time. If I know my big five for life, now I can treat it as a resource. If I don't was, know it, was it's a distraction. Was waren die ersten big fives in ihrem Leben? Uh, so I will tell you... Die sie bewusst wahrgenommen haben. Yeah, uh, so loving relationship with the people that matter most to me uh, is number one on my list. Uh, travel the world. As I mentioned, I'm an adventurer at heart, and so I have a deep desire to see this planet before it's all over. Uh, all over for me, not necessarily all over for the planet. Um, and interestingly, as I get older, I realize something that I didn't know when I was younger, which is it's getting harder. <laughs> like, I don't know. I just thought if I keep myself in shape, if I keep stretching, I'll be pretty much the same as I go through. No. Like, no. It takes an hour of prep time these days to have the same level of physicality and carefree feeling in my body is it used to take like 30 seconds when I was 17, you know? So uh, it makes it even more precious to me to go do it now or even better to inspire someone to do it when they're younger. Um, number three is to master mind over matter. Uh, I believe that simple little techniques can have transformative effects on our life, such as put it, putting a tiny filter between my brain and my mouth. Right? So just because I think something doesn't need I need to say it instantly. <laughs> and this is not something that anyone ever taught me. I suppose I should have figured it out earlier when I was. But when you're a parent, when you're a parent of a child, this is an unbelievably powerful technique. And I'll tell you a story and, and then I'll tell you the other two of my big five for life. But when my daughter was three, um, I don't know if you remember from your kids, but they're so little they can't reach the sink. You know, and so you've got the little steps that they climb. And so I had had a very hard day, uh, again, put it in perspective, but a hard day for what I was going through. I was working on something that mattered to me and somebody wasn't doing their part of the job, which is a personal issue of mine. Like if I do my part, I want the other person to do their part. And I had a contract that was supposed to close. It didn't close. I'd worked a lot of time on it. And so I was just frustrated, you know? And so here it is nighttime and it's brushing teeth time. Now, I don't know if you remember, but brushing teeth with a three-year-old is not the easiest thing because they don't have the dexterity, right? And so here's my little one and climbs up the little steps and she's dancing, right? She's dancing at the top yep. instead of brushing her teeth, right? And so in the household in which I grew up, 
Uh, and again, very loving parents, but going through what they went through, short fuse, <laughs> right? <laughs> And so when I was going through that experience, that would have been like a yell moment, right? Brush your teeth, get ready for bed. Like that would have been a thing, right? And so I'm watching my little one uh, do her little dance on there and I'm feeling the frustration, <laughs> right? Building inside of me. Now, I had made the decision on the day that my daughter was born, I would never raise my voice to her because of the way that I because of experiences that were part of my story. And I knew how painful that was for me. And so here I am, I'm feeling the frustration, right? And I have this filter between my brain and my mouth. And that tiny filter enables me to stop for just a second and ask myself, what am I really upset about right now? Is it the brushing the teeth? Mm. What do you think the answer was? Nein, das war es natürlich nicht. No, it had nothing to do. As a matter of fact, this was an awesome moment. This is my kid being happy and silly and goofy and loving life and dancing. Like, I live for that stuff, right? And I was able to say to myself, oh, this is interesting. Like, what am I about to do? And I realized that I was about to embark on what I now call transference, where I take other events of the day, other energy of the day, and I would potentially redirect it at the people who are not only physically around me, but who would most likely forgive me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wow, what a profound moment of awareness and inspiration because I put this tiny filter between my brain and my mouth. And here's the other thing that amazes me because this ties into the loving relationship of number one in my list, which is when we allow ourselves to, there is something to be learned from every human on this planet. Every story of, of every age, there is something to be learned from every creature on this planet. Uh, we live in like the most unbelievable learning environment. If we allow ourselves to put the ego to the side, to open ourselves up to realize we don't know everything, to have specific goals that we're working toward and to apply this little filter as we're going there. So it was a very profound moment for me. And so that's one example of mastering mind over matter, this concept of transference. Mm -hmm. So. Das heißt, die Poesie des Lebens entdecken wir, indem wir lernen, ein Lernender zu sein. Ja, yeah, totally, totally. And again, this is what I think is so amazingly cool about the human experience. Now, it's one thing if I'm the only person to have that aha moment. Like, that's a win, right? It means I'm a better father. It means I'm a better partner. It means I'm a better friend to realize this concept of transference and to catch myself before I would redo it do it you know expend that energy in the wrong way but more amazing to me is this concept of the fact that it's the collective that when i have the aha moment it now becomes available to everybody else hopefully through my books certainly but i think it's actually instantly available it's out there sort of in the the equivalent of the universal uh, search engine yeah ich habe nicht vergessen, dass Sie mir noch die zwei know, letzten um, ähm, from the rest noch, of them. aber darauf kommen wir noch um, uh, ich frage mich, ob diese Form von Lebensbetrachtung, nennen wir sie Sinnsuche, ähm, nicht etwas ist, was die ähm, klassische Form der Religiosität in gewisser Weise ersetzt hat. Oder wozu braucht man noch Religion? That's an interesting question in terms of what has been the role of thought leaders throughout human history, not, and you'd probably have to look region by region because I would say it's different every place. You know, a small little town in the Midwest of the United States where I live would be very different from someone who is a presence in maybe where you were growing up in Kabul as a kid or someone who is a shaman in Africa or in Peru, right? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, my guess is that as humans evolved, that there were people who spent more time thinking and less time in other roles. So there was maybe the hunters of the, the community. There were the people who were the inventors of the community. They would be more of the engineering type. There were the cartographers who, okay, we're moving from here to here and I remember that place, etc. And my guess is that there was also a piece of the collective that was the thinker, mm -hmm. right? 
And the thinker's job was to sort of have this bigger worldview perspective. Now, everybody benefited from everybody else. So the thinker wasn't above anyone else or below anyone else. They were just a part of the team, part of the community. And that over time, as people were feeling disconnected, unhappy, sad, that they would go to this person in the, in the community and they would say, can you help me think through this? I think the challenge over time has been that we each have the ability to think through these things and we each have something to offer. And so maybe the risk of humanity is to put ourselves or someone else on a pedestal that says, I'm the only one. <laughs> you want all the answers? Come to that person, right? Where in truth, I do believe that we each have the capacity to go inside of ourselves, tap into this collective consciousness and find answers. Does that mean we should only do that? I don't know, that feels kind of lonely. Like, mm. you know, like you and I sitting down can learn so much from each other mm. as opposed to just me sitting and thinking. But I think it's a balancing act. Ja, gerade, gerade diese, dieses Dialogische ist ja gerade in Gefahr, wenn wir zu sehr mit uns selbst ja beschäftigt sind. Und ich habe deswegen einen, einen leise, leise, leisen Verdacht oder einen, einen, noch ist etwas sozusagen Sand in diesem Getriebe, ähm, ob diese Form von, von, von Selbstverwirklichung, von Entwicklung der eigenen Person nicht insgesamt etwas ist, was vor allem meinem Ego dient. Oder würden Sie sagen, da gibt es auch etwas, was sich öffnen lässt für ein Kollektiv, was wiederum die Aufgabe aller Religionen ist? dass sie uns öffnen, also das Ego im Zerkleinern, Zermalmen, dass wir lernen, demütig und dankbar zu sein. Well, I think this goes back to the, uh, you know, the, the bigger your worldview, the more you have perspective on the challenges that you face. And so my guess is that what keeps the ego from running completely out of check is that you have empathy that you have a worldview where you realize there are many others who through no fault of their own were given starts to life or challenges in life that are far more challenging than my own. Uh, so I think it is a combination of things. I will tell you that many times people will say to me, people with very big hearts will say to me, John, I want to change the world in a good way. Like I want to have a positive impact. I want to have a powerful impact. And the, the, After many, many hours and days of thinking about this, the answer that I have come to is be authentic. Like think of the most beautiful art in the world. What would have happened if that person had not been that artist? Like if Picasso doesn't paint, if Renoir doesn't paint, what it, we miss out on their unbelievable gift, their contribution. If Steven Spielberg doesn't make the films that he makes and he instead says, well, no, for everybody else's benefit, I should go do this, right? So I think it's a combination of the two that when you allow yourself to figure out your big five for life, when you allow yourself to ask that question from the cafe menu, why am I here? That you're tapping into something so much bigger than ego. Mm -hmm. It is actually the core essence of your existence. And from there, you can add your contribution, your genius to the world in whatever shape that's going to take. And the world doesn't get worse from that. Quite the mm -hmm. contrary. Mm -hmm the world gets better, right? Someone sees a Steven Spielberg film and learns his story and says, I think I could be a storyteller, mm -hmm. right? Someone sees a Renoir and says, I think I could be a painter. Someone sees a great moment of parenting on a playground, right? Mm -hmm. They see a parent avoid transference and instead get down on one knee, be there for their child, take them in their arms, comfort them. And they say, wow, like when I'm a parent, I'm going to remember that moment. That's because they were authentic. Mm. And so I think it's the opposite of ego. I think it's actually way deeper, way more profound than mm -hmm. ego. Mm -hmm. Ego is when you're doing it for everybody else's benefit, right? Mm. It's not because you deeply at your core know that this is tied to who and what you are. Glauben Sie an Gott? So... I have traveled enough of the world that the single word God doesn't work for me. And I'll tell you why. Because if I travel down to Honduras, El Salvador, 
um, Nicaragua, places that I have been, which are amazing, and the people are amazing, right? And I'm explaining something, either an experience that I had or a belief system that I had, and I said, no, God is the answer, right? God is the answer. They would, they would not understand what I'm saying, and they would say probably no, they would say it in Spanish to me, but they would say uh, no, right? Because they would say, I don't know if you're a Spanish, Spanish speaker, but they would say, no, Dios is the answer. Dios is the answer, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's the Spanish word for God. And so for me to get that attached to a single word is very difficult given the experiences that I've had in multilingual, multicultural countries. Now, the essence of it or the concept of it, is there a higher energy power, um, presence that is somehow the guiding force for this human experience. This ties back into what I was talking about before, which is, I don't know, after all of the thinking that I've given to it, there's only one of two options. Either your parents had sex, nine months later, you popped out, and you're going to get your 28,900 days, you're going to live, you're going to die, that's it, and this, like, that's it. That's the whole story. Or that there is this larger game going on, there is this higher power, there is this bigger meaning behind life. You were something before you were born. You entered the physical form for a reason. Like this goes back to the purpose, the meaning part. You get your 28,900 days to fulfill that reason, to experience the human life, to grow, to contribute to the collective consciousness, and then you die. And when the physical body ends, you go back to being whatever you were before. Mm -hmm. Now what's fascinating to me is no matter which one of those you subscribe to, you kind of arrive at the same conclusion, which is, I might as well be brave. I might as well be courageous. I might as well do my best to live an extraordinary life and whatever that means for me. Because if it's the first one, this is all you get. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. the clock is ticking. And so you might as well have an extraordinary life in every way, shape, or, you know, let the fears go. Like, be the parent you want to be, be the person bleiben, you want to be. Bleiben wir bei, diesem, bei dieser Version, die vor allem in Europa fast schon das gesamte 20. Jahrhundert geprägt hat, nämlich die Einsicht, es gibt überhaupt keinen Gott. Und unsere Endlichkeit ist alles, was wir haben. Wait, but is it, is it that there's no hätte. God or no meaning? Wenn es keinen Gott gibt, das hat schon Dostoevsky gesagt, was soll dann für einen letzten Sinn geben? Das heißt, wir leben, wir müssen Sinn selbst stiften in diesem Leben, in der Tat, wir müssen Dinge schön machen. Ich erinnere mich an, an ihre Geschichte von ihrer Tochter. Die Aufgabe war, die Zähne zu putzen, aber sie tanzt. Und das ist etwas, was unerwartet ist, aber right. diese Situation unendlich schön und bleibend macht in ihrem Gedächtnis. Sie hätte nie an diese Situation denken, wenn sie nur das getan hätte, was sie von ihr wollten. Das heißt, wir können doch in Situationen Sinn entdecken, Lächeln entwickeln, aber es gibt keinen letzten Sinn. Meine Frage nach Gott, etwas abrupt kam sie, ähm, war so gedacht, ob sie an einen letzten Sinn <lacht> glauben, ob es so etwas gibt wie eine, eine unerschütterliche Lesart unseres Lebens oder wir entwickeln selbst, denn sie haben auch in, im Gespräch mit mir und das sagen sie auch in ihren Büchern, in ihren Vorträgen, äh, Selbsterfolg ist etwas, was wir selbst definieren. Das hört ich in meinem Ohr doch etwas zu offen, denn das kann dann auch Misserfolg sein, wir brauchen Kriterien und Gott wäre so ein Kriterium, was uns in Anspruch nimmt, wogegen wir eigentlich keine, keine Meinung mehr haben können, wenn wir einmal Einsicht gewonnen haben, es gibt den Ewigen. <lacht> right, so, I, per, to answer your question originally, by the way, I do believe that there's more to the human experience than just, you're here, you get 28,000, you die, and that's it. So, personally, after all my introspective work, Uh, and thinking about it and experiencing it, I do believe that no, like you're here, the human, the human experience exists for a reason. Now, this is where it ties into what you were just saying. Who gets to define the rules for that, mm. right? I think that it is not predestiny. I don't think that you arrive and the story is entirely written for you, right? And so then, You have to ask, in my opinion, I have to ask the bigger question, well, if there is a God, right? And, and, and again, you can substitute word of choice in there for someone who has a different perspective. So higher consciousness, um, Allah, Buddha, God, like you can pick the word that fits your personal belief systems. But if there is that presence, that entity, 
why does it need humans running around for statistically 28,900 days? Like, why would it, an all-knowing presence, all-powerful, all-capable, need little minions running around? And the only answer I can come to is that in some way, shape, or form, as each of us learns, as each of us contributes, as each of us grows, that the entire thing grows, including the God presence. And so it's just more efficient, right? If, if you think of it like the entire planet was here and think of God as like a single entity, a single person or a, a deer or whatever, a single life form, it'd be like the only thing that that life form would learn would be whatever it learns during its timeline. But if you have nine billion of them, plus all the other life forms out there, think of the rate at which you grow. Think of the rate at which you learn. Now, fascinatingly enough, this is only the tip of the iceberg because then you go, well, wait, why does God need to grow? Like what else is going on in the universe that makes that a requirement or an interest or a passion of whatever this is? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think about it all the time, but I don't know the answer yet. Yeah. But I, I don't think it's just, I, I don't think life would be much in the growth factor if all I did was follow somebody else's set of rules or guidelines, mm. but I wasn't actively thinking, contributing, like that would minimize the contribution of the collective. I'm not mm. sure that the godlike essence would benefit from that. So it doesn't make as much sense to me mathematically. Yeah, yeah, genau, genau. Ich glaube auch, die, die reifere religiöse theologische Positionen wären auch zu sagen, Gott braucht uns in dieser Weise natürlich gar nicht sondern wir brauchen ihn. Und yeah. aufgrund seiner Liebe erschafft er eine Welt, die sozusagen mit ihm wachsen kann und an Erkenntnis äh, bereichert werden kann. Was mich aber insbesondere interessiert, es geht hier gar nicht darum, ob Sie nun jetzt glauben oder nicht, sondern es geht vielmehr darum, ob die, äh, diese Bedürftigkeit der Menschen, die sie erkennen, die sie in gewisser Weise auch bedienen oder ihre eigene Bedürftigkeit nach Sinn, nach bedeutungsvolle Gestaltung des Lebens, nicht etwas ist, was uns immer mehr zeigt, dass die alte, die ehrwürdige Form der Religiosität in gewisser Weise Schritt für Schritt verabschiedet wird. Denn die Metapher, die Symbolik, sogar die Haltungen, die sie formulieren, sind durchaus religiös. Bleiben wir nur bei der Zahl 5. Das ist etwas urreligiöses. Denken Sie an die äh, fünf äh, Bücher Mose, an, mhm. an die fünf Wunden Christi, an die fünf Säulen äh, des Islams. Äh, die, bereits die Zahl hat schon eine eigene Karriere gemacht innerhalb der Religionen. Oder wenn Sie auch ein, das Leben beschreiben als eine bestimmte Form von Erkenntnisform, äh, in der wir, wir wachsen. Was ist nun geschehen, dass Religionen nicht mehr ziehen? Dass Menschen dennoch aber ihre Sehnsüchte haben? Wie meistere ich mein Leben? Und da, da kommen Sie ins Spiel. Ja, yeah, so first of all, I, you could probably see it in my face a couple of seconds ago. So you and I had talked before we started this interview. And I was saying, like, so again, what does success look like? What's the point of this interview? And it was to, to come up with something that is profound and powerful so that someone watching has a life-changing moment. Equally, I find when I have the chance to sit down with fascinating people such as yourself that I have moments, right? And so I just had one when you were talking. And so my goal is always three, at least three. I want the audience to get at least three big things. And I'm always looking for like, oh, did I get one? Did I get one? And uh, so I just got a major ping. So that's one of my three just hit me when you were talking. So I'm going to need you to remind me of the last part of your question, but I want to save this part first. In this story that we're talking about, like potential realities of how the human experience works and why it works that way. Mm. If the goal is to grow, right? And we grow by having a multitude of different experiences. So we've got humans, we've got other animals, and the collective God presence is growing through all of these experiences. Wouldn't it make the most sense if there was actually a variety of different perspectives through which a human would experience human life so that the growth would be exponential? So if there was only one religion then there'd only be sort of one way that we all go through it. There'd be one set of rules, one set of guidelines, one set of practices, mm. and there would be a certain amount of learning that would come from that. But if I was designing the ultimate learning environment, 
I would make sure that there was all kinds of different ones. Because now every human going through that one would look at life a little differently and this one. And I would want to make sure that in some way, shape or form, as the game was growing, that the people over here had the chance to interact with the people here and over there so that everybody could learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Because that would be the greatest opportunity for growth. Mm -hmm. And if that truly is the meaning of the human experience is to contribute, then that design is way better than just a single religion. Now, to your point, uh, this is another ping for me. So you're, you're already at, at least two, and I think you're way past two at this point. But think back to the soccer example that we talked about, the football example, right? So in the past, as humanity was evolving on the planet, there was a very, very minor percentage of people who had literacy, right? I mean, how many people could read 200 years ago, 300 years ago as a percentage of the population? So they relied on someone who could read to learn what the people over here were doing, over here were doing, over here were doing. Mm. Now they could certainly think for themselves, but if they wanted to get exposure to other humans' thoughts, they couldn't jump on an airplane and fly there. They couldn't get on the internet and read about it. They couldn't look on TikTok for a 30-second video about it. So all they had in terms of access was the merchant who was going from another town to another town, or more importantly, they would go to that person in the community who is the thinker and the processor and the help me figure out what this means person. And mm. that person was reading because they had access to the few books that were available. Mm. Humanity is not like that anymore. Maybe that as the construct of the game has changed, that the reason there is less of a, a, a feeling of need on the part of the average person to go to a particular building or read a particular book mm. is because the whole game is constantly evolving. And so it's not as necessary anymore. And maybe if that's the truth, then we should allow ourselves to embrace that possibility and say, ooh, this means that not just he or not just her has the information, but everybody's got interesting stuff. Das ist eine kollektive Angelegenheit, die uns ja. alle bewegt und wir gemeinsam sozusagen als Lernende aufeinander bezogen sind. Ähm, ja. die, die Frage, Sorry, die ich I don't want to interrupt you, but thank you for that thought. Like, I'm that one with me. Because that's, that's a vision of the human experience that I can get even more excited about than I was when I sat in this chair before we started. Ja. So, thank you. Ich habe zu danken. Die, ähm, die Frage dahinter, die ich Ihnen stellen möchte, ist, weil wir darüber gesprochen haben, Religionen ziehen nicht mehr in dieser Form. Die sind ähm, durchaus da, sie, sie sind versucht, aber bei Ihnen scheint Erfolg da zu sein. Was ist das Geheimnis dieser Form der, der Kommunikation? Well, interestingly, I would say that my form of communication is not all that different than what you've seen in the past in terms of what made people think or um, look at a situation in a different way. I tell stories, you know? Um, I was a kid in school that you'd have 12 pages of a textbook and 11 pages were facts and figures and one page, typically in my school books as a kid, there was a color on the page, it was like the purple page. And the purple page was a story that explained the previous 11 pages. If it wasn't for the purple pages, I don't think I would have gotten through school. <laughs> so, like, I, I got it when it was told in a story format that just worked for my brain. And so when I share something that was an aha moment in life for me, I do it through stories. Mm -hmm. My guess is that if you were to look at the pieces of historical writing that have been most powerful for individuals throughout history, it's probably the stories. Like yeah. that's where the dots yeah. connect, right? That's where the example is of who I could be if I want to be more like this, you know? Und, und also es ist ein, eine Menge an, an dem, was man religiöse Sprache nennt, in einer säkularen Form, auch in ihrem ganzen, in ganzen Werk vorhanden. Allein schon, dass sie auch eine Ritualität haben, dass sie doch, man würde sie auch als eine Art Guru, moderner, postmoderne Form von, von Guru erkennen, also eine, eine religiöse <lacht> Figur, die Menschen inspiriert. Nicht? Also die, die, das Wort ist natürlich sehr inflationär gebraucht, aber das meine ich nicht so, sondern eher eine Person, die als Inspirationsquelle dienen kann, 
Sie haben einen Hut an, das ist sozusagen eine gewisse Ritualität. Lassen Sie uns einen kurzen Blick in einen Alltag werfen. This is a day in my life as a full-time author. First things first, I made sure my hat looked right. And with that done, it was time for 20 minutes of my morning breathing routine. I used the Wim Hof method and love it. That was followed by some stretching and then a giant glass of water, which is a must for me as part of my morning routine. I'm currently working on a new book, so my next activity was to head to the park where I do most of my writing. My daily goal when I'm writing is 10 pages. And by the time I finished those, I was starving. So I went to grab some food. This place makes the most amazing barbecue chicken and broccoli lunch bowls. They are seriously delicious. And one of my go-to standards when I'm grabbing lunch. After that, I headed over to our audio studio. As an author, I do a lot of interviews remotely. And this one was for a podcast I was a guest on. Then I picked up my daughter from school and we did some driving training because she's practicing to get her license. At night, I had one of my favorite dinners, fresh made pizza with arugula salad, followed that with an episode of Andor, which is an incredible show, and that was my day. Ja, man kann die John als einen glücklichen Menschen vorstellen. Was, hätte, <lacht> was hätten Sie gemacht, wenn Ihre Bücher keinen Erfolg hätten? Oh, interesting question. Uh, I think that I probably would have been, been sharing the experiences I had as a traveler. That was something so profound and life-changing for me. It was, you know, I left everything behind in my 30s. You, you just typically don't do that for people. I was, uh, you know, people do it at 18. They do it, oh, I'm going to take a gap year after school. Uh, but by the time you're in your like low 30s, people are thinking, well, you should have a house and a kid and a car and the rest of that. So the idea of going off and leaving everything behind and backpacking around the world just seemed, especially back then, you know, again, like now there's so many people that are travel blogging and the rest of that. But back when I did it, that wasn't the case. And so I, I may have decided back then that my purpose, because it, it all came back to purpose, was to help people experience travel if that was one of their things. So maybe I just would have shared through stories in some way, shape, or form what I had done and hope that it inspired. Maybe I would have toured people and taken them. Mm. I, I like being a guide in life. I like taking the things that I've learned and helping someone else. Because when I was young, I was struggling, like really struggling. Uh, when, I was, when I was 13, 14, 16, I mean, I didn't see the point of life. I didn't feel good about myself. I didn't feel good about pretty much anything. I didn't feel my contributions would amount to anything at all, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And so I know how it feels to be sad like that. I know how it feels to be depressed and lonely like that and to not see the point. And so I've always loved when I meet someone and they say to me, and this happens a lot, they say, I read Das Café, I'm trying to develop and, and I thought I was alone. I yeah. thought I was the only person thinking this. And so to be able to share whether it's one-on-one, -on -one, whether it's through a story, whether it's through a book or an interview, so that someone knows they're not alone. Like, that's always been a piece of my wiring. Das wäre ein, eine Form, eine Form der, der, des anderen Scheiterns. Vielen Dank für diese Dankbarkeit, die Sie uns geschenkt haben. Was denkt ihr? Was ist der Sinn des Lebens? Brauchen wir überhaupt einen? Und wenn ja, wie finden wir ihn? Schreibt es unten in die Kommentare und weitere Gedankenanstöße findet ihr in diesen Sendungen.